so in P in example seven, we broke up the fraction to make it uh, separate expressions that could be uh, power rule uh, oriented. And so that, that's kind of what we're looking at here. If we can take whatever the expression is and modify it so that it, it's, a, it's a friendlier expression, then that's the way to go. So in this case, I see that I could write it as f of x is equal to five over four x to the negative fourth, which is gonna greatly simplify things because it's just a power rule away from being completed, right? So negative four times five fourths is gonna be negative five. Then we'd have x to the negative fifth. And then that's all, that's all there is to it, right? As opposed to quotient rule, which, you know, it, it, as quotient rule goes, it wouldn't have been too crazy, but it's still more than you would wanna do, all right? Most likely. Same idea for number nine. You know, take the time to see if it's worth your time. Take the time to see if it's worth your time to simplify a little bit because that might make the expression easier to the point where it goes from being, you know, this nasty thing to something that maybe you would not categorize as nasty. Okay, so I'm going to distribute the x squared through, and we'll get, I'll write the intermediate step before I simplify, 2x squared over x minus x squared over x plus 1, which would simplify further to 2x, and the, the, the second part is going to stay as is. Now, by the sum and difference rules, for derivatives, we can take the derivative of these two expressions separately from one another. So notation-wise, if I want dy dx, I'd be looking at the derivative of this expression minus the derivative of this expression. All right. You wouldn't have to write that. I'm just doing that for note-taking purposes to show you that that's what we're going to do. We're going to take the derivative of those two things separately. Okay. So the first one, 2x, just has a derivative of 2. The second one, so minus, that's a quotient. Okay. So this is a quotient. So we would use the quotient rule. Now, if the x plus 1 was on the top, I'd look to simplify it the way we did in the pre, uh, two problems ago, but it's not. So we, we can't split the fraction, not unless we want to get conjugates involved and stuff like that, but it's not practical. So you get our low D high minus high D low over denominator squared and away we go business going on. So low is X plus one. D high, meaning the derivative of the high part of the expression as in the numerator, derivative of the numerator is 2x minus high x squared, d low, derivative of x plus 1. Well, the x goes to 1, the 1 goes to 0, so it's just a 1 over the denominator squared. And away we go. And so that would be your derivative. You know, Unless the directions told you to simplify, it just said differentiate. And remember, differentiate is another way of saying derivative. So you get all these different ways of saying the same thing. Find the slope of the line tangent of the curve. Find the instantaneous rate of change. Find the derivative. Differentiate. They all mean the same thing. All right. All right so the question is, why is it the quotient rule again? Uh, so the, it's the quotient rule because we're looking at a quotient of two expressions, right? So it's a quotient rule because we're dealing with a quotient, right? Quotient is just another way of saying the division of two expressions, right? So if you're looking at two algebraic expressions that are being divided in such a way that they can't be simplified, then, or at least easily simplified, then you would apply the quotient rule to the situation. Okay. 
number 10 looks like the product of two factors. So I get a factor here and a factor here. But one of those factors itself has a quotient, right? Something over something else. So we might be in for it here, but you may consider just taking the time, kind of sucking it up and doing some algebra just because you kind of look at it and say, well, I think I would rather do a little bit of algebra now than the product rule with an embedded quotient rule, okay? I mean, that, that's, that's a decision that you need to make, but my thought processes kind of take me towards factoring, distributing, simplifying, seeing if I can, can, if I can make the algebraic expression simpler so that I can get going on the calculus with a, with a much easier expression, right? So in this case, I mean, we can look at factors, but I can tell you right now, <clears throat> even if anything was factorable, like in terms of this expression here, the, the numerator, it's not gonna factor in, in a way that it's gonna allow things to cancel because this expression is not factorable, All right? So what you gotta do is just kind of assume that you're in for a ride, no matter how you slice it. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna distribute this against this, All right? So each term of the first expression gets multiplied by each term of the second expression. So X to the fourth plus X to the third plus X squared. Then each, or the, the second expression gets multiplied by each term. I'm sorry, the second term of the first expression gets multiplied by each term of the second expression. So negative X cubed minus X squared minus X. And then lastly, that negative three gets distributed. So negative three X squared minus three X minus three. Now this whole thing is over just an X squared plus one. So I'll just put that in there just so I don't forget to write it. I just kind of worry about things like that. But we have the expansion of the trinomial against the trinomial, all right? I'm gonna to look to simplify that because I, I certainly don't wanna work with the expression as is. I see an X cubed and a negative X cubed. I see an X squared and a negative X squared, all right? Everything else is gonna combine, but not cancel. So I'll have an X to the fourth. I'll have a negative three X squared, a negative four X, and a negative three all over x squared plus one, all right? So what I would do at this point is just do a quick double check on Desmos by typing in the original expression, the original set of factors, x squared minus x minus three times x squared plus x plus one and see if that's equivalent to what it just expanded out to by my algebra. And if it doesn't, then I start looking for my mistake. And the only reason I ever check is because it's algebra. It's kind of designed for you to make a mistake, All right? So you have a quick look. Take a look at your two expressions one at a time. Looks like they're mapping to the same location. So we're in good shape there, All right? So my expansion is, uh, is pretty much the same. So the question is, would it ever be, would it ever be beneficial to do synthetic or long division and get the negative X minus four? All right, so uh, it sometimes it is, right? So you, you can try that, that might work, All right? So, <clears throat> but then again, it might not. And so you, you just kind of 
try something and if it doesn't work try something else right? it's it's not a satisfying answer but you know that's the nature of algebra um so the follow-up uh, a different question was how would we know to do all this on a test well you have two choices i mean looking back at the pre the, the lesson that led up to this we learned about two types of rules that you studied over the last two days one was the product rule and one was the quotient rule so what i'm looking at here is an expression f of x so a big big nasty function f of x is equal to two things that are multiplied so a product one of which contains a quotient so unless i want to do product rule and quotient rule in the same problem i got to do something else so what i do is i bring my prior knowledge of algebra to the table and say okay so what can i do to simplify this expression down in order to make the calculus easier, all right? So if you think back to algebra one, algebra two, college algebra trig, you know, all the prior course pre-calc, you spent all that time learning how to simplify expressions, factoring, canceling, multiplying, canceling, <laughs> dividing, canceling, adding fractions together, canceling, always trying to simplify down. It's for these problems that you are learning to do that. Because, and to finally answer your question, it's, do you want to work with this? Or do you want to work with this? Now, you might say, I'd prefer to work with the original one, but we're looking at just a simple quotient here. And so when I go to find my derivative, it's low D high minus high D low over denominator squared and away we go, All right? So low X squared plus one, the d high part. So I'm going to take the derivative of my numerator, which is polynomial, so it should be pretty easy now. Each, each piece is a power rule. So 4x cubed minus 6x minus 4. All right. So that's the low d high minus the high. So I'm rewriting my original numerator. Well, the original, quote unquote, original. So this, this numerator, x to the fourth minus three x squared minus four x minus three, d low, the low expression is x squared plus one, the derivative of which is equal to two x, over the denominator squared, And that's it, all right? And like I said, you don't have to simplify unless you're told to. This question didn't tell you to simplify. We were just taking derivatives. <clears throat> and honestly, it didn't even tell you to take a derivative because of the, the little typo there. It should say differentiate, so that's a typo for somebody. All right. Because every one of these questions was asking us to find a derivative. So it's implied. It won't be implied on the test. It will, of course, be explicitly stated, just like you see in the practice test. So continuing on, we get into higher order derivatives, which sound really complicated. But I can tell you that they're not any more complicated than finding derivatives conceptually. The only thing is, once you find a derivative, you might have to find the derivative of your derivative, right? You might have to find the derivative of your derivative's derivative, right? So it's basically saying you're going to find a derivative do it using one of the techniques that we're learning. Then you're going to get that answer. And in some cases, you're going to be asked to find the derivative of the answer. Right, so you'll take it down another level. Sometimes it's gonna get easier, sometimes it's gonna get more challenging. All right. And and you'll see, yeah, you're you're going down the rabbit hole. It is like uh it's straight out of a Nolan movie. Yeah, it's definitely math inception. The dream within a dream, of course. But uh but the interpretation of it can be uh can be really rewarding. 
right? But we got to get there by learning the skill first, right? So you have all this notation here. It's a lot of stuff, but basically, if you just kind of latch on to the primes, that kind of gets you to a good place. So we're looking at the original function, for example, f of x, or the original equation y. One way to represent an original equation could be either one of those, right? But when I differentiate, for example, the f of x, we've been typically calling that f prime of x. If I wanna take another derivative, just throw on another prime. If I wanna take the derivative of that answer, throw on yet another prime. The problem is eventually it might get a little out of hand with the number of primes that you write. Like if I wanna take the 99th derivative to write like 99 little tick marks, that could be a little out of control. So after the third derivative, we start writing the level of the derivative in parentheses so as not to confuse it with a power, right? So we're not taking the function, raise it, raising it to the fourth power. In parentheses, it means fourth derivative, right? So we're going down different levels until we get to limbo here with the nth derivative, right? So that would be the any derivative. You know, we could have the 100th derivative or the, the, the 17th derivative, you know, it, it all depends, right? The same holds true with y's, we can just slap on primes, right? <clears throat> but if we wanna use the d, dy dx business, it gets a little weird because of the, the placement of the power. You know, dy dx, that's easy enough. We've been using that a bunch, right? When we say d dx of f of x, that's making the assumption that we're looking at y as being equivalent to some function of x. y and f of x are the same. So this would be really the same thing as saying dy dx. Okay? Because if I were to swap out this f of x for a y, it would be dy dx. And I think it's a little messy, so I get rid of that. All right? But that's really what it would be. I could just kind of jot that off on the side. It would be d dx of y, which is the same as dy dx. All right, that's what we were talking about a few classes ago. All right, but when we go to take the second derivative, we're saying that we want the the d. We're looking at that in, in multiple levels. We're looking at it as a lowercase delta, change in y or change in x, but on an instantaneous level shorthand uh, use as a D instead of a delta. But what that power of two is really saying, if we're saying in shorthand verbiage, we're saying the second derivative of Y per unit of change in X, right? But that's, it's kind of strange in the sense that you would think that this power of two would apply to the function itself. Just like you see, you have the X with the two afterwards. Here, you would think you'd have the Y with the two afterwards. But there's actually a reason for that, a good reason, very good reason. Right? When you're dealing with a function, right? So let me just sketch it out real quick. Oh, I don't know that I ever leave myself in a room, but I'll, I'll do an arbitrary function over here. We'll call this Y equals F of X. Right? When you're finding the first derivative, you're finding the slope of the line tangent to the curve at any point along the curve, right? So the slope here, the slope of this line, the slope is dy dx, right? Now, depending on where you are on that curve, you could have a bunch of different slopes. I'm gonna bring it in a lot so I can actually sketch this out halfway decently. That one's terrible. All right. So what we would have, and I just put a few of them here. Maybe I'll throw in another one over here. Throw in a highlighter. So I'd have a slope, another slope, another slope, another slope, another slope. But there's infinitely many over an interval. All right. 
So what I'm talking about, or when I'm talking about the second derivative, I'm talking about the rate of change of the rate of changes, all right? So when I say d2 dx squared, I'm saying the rate of change of the rates of change. All right, now the rate itself is related to horizontal movement, right? So we're looking at a point here, a point here, a point here, a point here, and a point here, all related to one another through horizontal displacement, all right? So horizontal displacement, then it, it projects down to the function, but still it's a horizontal displacement. So we would call this, uh, uh, we call it delta x, delta x, another delta x, and another delta x. Right. So each one of these slopes is already related to a delta x. So we're tacking on another delta x. Right. And if we make those infinitesimal changes, so teensy tiny little changes, the capital delta, the triangle, schmidges down or shrinks down to a delta. So we, we would get another delta, lowercase x, right? So that's where this would come from, right? But the y function never changed. We're still working with this y, the same y function all the way through. Every determination that we make related to this scenario, whatever it happens to be, whatever we're modeling, is going to come back to whatever this function is, y equals f of x. That didn't change. So it's the second derivative with respect to changes in x, two levels of changes in x, but always related to the same function. Right? So, I mean, if you, if you want a, a more uh, abstract example, so I'm glad you brought up inception. Because it's like, all right, you're going to go through three, four, five different levels of a dream, but it's still you. It's still you that's going through the different levels of the dream. Now, if you haven't seen Inception, then this analogy doesn't make any, make any sense. But if you're going, if, if you have seen it, then it, it might make perfect sense. But if you're going through multiple levels of a dream state, you know, the dream within a dream within a dream within a dream, it's still you that is the dreamer, all right? So that, that, might, that might actually help kind of give you a better sense of why it all would remain a why. But that, that's kind of a look at the theory. There's, there's a good graphical analysis that relates to this that we're actually gonna talk about in the third tech assignment. So just sit tight for that. Because um, you know, I know some of us are more theoretic minded, theoretical minded, and some of us are more practical minded. So, if you're more practical minded, that third tech assignment will help you understand this a little bit more. Right. But I can tell you that you've you've definitely seen and heard the concepts of multiple derivatives because even though we didn't touch on it in this unit, when we talk about velocity, velocity is a rate of change of position but then acceleration is a rate of change of velocity. So it's a rate of change of a rate of change. So that would make it a second derivative, right? So more on that in the second unit, but, but that's just a little taste of it. Right now, again, this whole unit at this point is, and, and throughout and forever will always be about skills, right? So that's where we're, Kind of living here. I throw in some of the theory because I know, I know we need it, we want it, but, um, but yeah, it's, it's largely mostly about skills. Yeah, exactly. I, yeah, de definitely watch Inception for uh, for the, the educational aspect of it. And while you're at it, watch Tenet. Uh, it it, it kind of got a bad rap. The movie Tenet, T E N E T also a Nolan movie, but, um, but I've become sort of obsessed with it. 
in terms of the uh, the underlying structure of time. And it's it's kind of like the unofficial sequel to uh, to Inception. It's not no not the same characters, not even the same plot, but it's kind of like the same spirit. Okay? So if you haven't seen Tenet and you were a fan of Inception, then that that's you can add that to your list too. That was a good one. Yeah, there we go. All the Tenet fans coming out. Yeah, yeah. I've, I've, I, I checked out so many things on uh, on YouTube about theories and all that, and there there are a couple that um, that really kind of blow your mind a little bit, but they're all in the spoiler territory. So I'll, I'll let a little time go by before I uh, before I talk about it freely. Nolan verse exactly. All right, so the second derivative, we have f of x, the original function. I'm going to rewrite that as 12 x to the one third power. The first derivative of that would be f prime or, you know, one third times 12 x to the one third minus one is negative two thirds. Then the second derivative, f double prime, do it again. So four times negative two thirds, negative eight thirds, x to the, and then negative two thirds minus one would be negative five thirds. All right. So skill wise, it could be as, as simple, quote unquote, simple as that. Uh, I, I actually think you'll find if, if you know your basic trig rules, you'll probably find the trig cases to be a little bit simpler, or at least for the basic situations like sines and cosines. Right? Even though this one looks pretty scary, the 97th derivative, that's insane. But, you know, one thing at a time find the second derivative, h of t. So the, the independent variable is t instead of x, but it's going to take on the same rule. So h prime of t, hang on to the four, take the derivative of the parent function sine separately, which becomes cosine of t. Then hang on to your constant multiple of negative five, And then take the derivative of the cosine function. Cosine function, cosine of t has a derivative of negative sine of t. Now I mentioned before that you shouldn't simplify unless the question directly tells you to. However, this one, you know, didn't directly tell us to, but we got to take a second derivative. It's probably in our best interest to clean it up just a little bit. So four cosine of t plus five sine of t. So when I take my second derivative, it's a little easier, right? So I hang on to my four, multiply by the derivative of cosine of t, which is negative sine of t. Hang on to my multiple of five, multiply by the derivative of sine of t, which is cosine of t then feel free to leave it like this and don't worry about simplifying, right? So there will come, in, as you see here, there will come times and places and situations where you'll feel the need to simplify for your own benefit, but you don't need to do it for my benefit unless I explicitly say, find the derivative and simplify. Okay. Now, the one that you've all been waiting for, if you haven't seen this one before, it's kind of cool. So it says find the 97th derivative. So yeah, we might as well just dive in. F prime of X, cosine of X, derivative of sine is cosine. F double prime of X, derivative of cosine is negative sine. All right, talked about those rules last time. So 
So I need my third derivative. So here, you know, we don't have a rule for the derivative of negative sign, but I do have a constant multiple rule. This is the same as saying negative one times the sine of X. So hang on to my negative one and multiply it by the derivative of sine of X, which is cosine of X. And we'll be left with negative cosine of X. Then, you know, it's, it cleans up kind of nicely. We'll find the fourth derivative. And this is the point where if you haven't seen this kind of problem before, you might be wondering, is he really doing this? Is he gonna do 97 derivatives? No, sit tight, because the next one, we're just gonna go back to, this, this is already kind of tailor-made for us. The derivative of cosine is negative sine. Bring down that negative one, negative one times sine of X, uh, sorry, times negative sine of X is sine of X. So we're, we've completed a cycle here, okay? So our first derivative got us a cosine of X. Our second derivative got us a negative sine of X. Third derivative, negative cosine of X. Fourth derivative, back to a sine of X, all right? So it's logical to assume because the derivative of sine of X initially was cosine of X, that this cycle is just going to repeat, all right? If you remember the powers of I, it was always a cycle. And then once you recognize what the cycle was, you know, this is the mod four cycle. And you can start figuring out what, what your derivative is going to be, all right? So we know in this case here that any multiple of four, all right? We have the first derivative, second, third, fourth, multiples of four are gonna bring us back to sine, okay? So I can do five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, and so on. I can count it up if I want. I got a little, when I was a student and I, and I did the powers of I, and it would be like, all right, what's I to the 97th power? You know, I would figure it out the right way. And then I would also do it with my fingers, just like one, two, three, four, you know, just that, that extra layer of double checking my work, just a little paranoia. So that's possible. But if we're going in multiples of four, then it also would be logical to assume that the 100th derivative would be the same result as the fourth derivative. So working backwards, the 99th derivative would be the same as the third derivative. 98th derivative would be the same as the second derivative and 97th derivative would be the same as the first derivative, which in this case is a cosine. Okay, put my arrow on the wrong thing. So anyway, what I can conclude from this is that the 97th derivative, which would be written as F that little 97 in parentheses power of X would be equal to cosine of X. Now, aside from that being just a fun academic problem, I can't think of a single application of that. Aside from like the, the topic in Calc 3, uh, Calc 2 actually, you do it there now. Uh, Taylor polynomials, where you go out in you know, multiple derivatives, uh, Taylor series and things like that, um, which has its own its, its own world of applications. But to physically compute the 97th derivative without using technology, that doesn't seem like it would be uh, a practical thing to do. But it's fun, so we do it. So, oh, I just realized that looked pretty bad. Um, so graphically, you recognize hopefully that we're looking at three different types of functions. One appears to be a parabola in example four, another appears to be a line, and uh, yet another appears to be a, another line, but this time a horizontal line. 
And if they're asking us to ca categorize one as the original function, uh, another as the first derivative, and another as the, the second derivative. And it's like, okay, well, well, how would we ever be able to tell? But if you if you were to make a you know educated guess and say, all right, I think this parabola, for example, has an equation. I'll give you a pretty typical parabola equation, like y equals x squared, right? Pretty standard. The first derivative, now they're using f, so I'll use f. The first derivative of that would be 2x. The second derivative would be just a 2, right? Now, this looks kind of funky, because they, we didn't use y's, we use f's and f's pri, f primes and stuff. But each one of these, in and of themselves, represent an equation. This is the same as saying y equals x squared. This derivative fun function can be graphed as y equals 2x. And this constant function can be graphed as y equals 2. All right? One would be a parabola. One would be a not constant line. And the other would be a constant line. Okay, right? so from that information, we could say that this must be f, this must be f prime, and this must be f double prime. But if you want a more generalized example, then what I would recommend is that you write in in Desmos the equation of a parabola in a generalized form. I prefer the standard form or the vertex form, a times x minus h squared plus k And I prefer this one not because I'm a teacher and I prefer to make things more complicated than they need to be because that's part of a teacher's DNA. No, it has more to do with, okay, so it's part that. Um, but mostly it has to do with the fact that I can look at this graph on paper and see that the vertex appears to be at one negative one, all right? H and K represent the vertex. So if I make my vertex, oops, tapped on the wrong thing one negative one, I overshot the mirror, there we are. Then I'm looking at something that looks pretty, pretty close to what I, what I would expect it to look like, all right? It goes through zero, it goes through two. It has the right vertex. I knew it was the parabola going in, yeah. And then from there, Desmos can handle graphing derivatives. So I would say F, prime of x, you will graph that for me, f double prime of x. Now, the f double prime of x, that, that's kind of a weird one. Not because, not because Desmos can't handle it, but when it's a constant function, Desmos thinks that you're just looking for a numerical answer. It, it doesn't think you're looking for a variable answer. So here it just reports to two. And so you'd have to know that that represents a constant function, but you know, you, you kind of get what you need out of this after you got the first derivative, because by process of elimination, you would say, okay, well, the other one has to be the second derivative. You know? So that's kind of the, the moral of the story there. But you can use Desmos, even if it's something more complicated, like involving a rational function. Right. You just, you got your different levels here, put a general form of your function in and, and see what happens with your first and second derivatives. Right. So there's nothing wrong with that. It's always a good idea. You know, explore. That's why we have the graphing technology. There's a lot of things that we were not able to do in the past because we, we didn't have the graphing technology. And there's actually, honestly, to be fair, there were a lot of things that I didn't understand fully until the technology caught up with, uh, or I caught up with the technology or the technology caught up with me or whatever, whatever the right way of saying it is. But, you know, make use of it, at least to understand the concepts. All right, so let me stop this.